for free space, we can plot the dispersion. Yeah, in free space, we have like a plane wave. Yeah, kx minus omega t, like a sine or exponential function in terms of complex amplitudes. And omega can be arbitrary. Yeah, and dispersion is linear. Omega is a, is a linear function of wave, wave number. But if we deal with periodic structures like a photonic crystal, we see we should have some bands. Yeah. This is a, uh, a loud band, and this is a band gap here. You see? So, uh, or we can deal with the first brilliant zone, for example, uh, when the wave number changes from minus pi over period to pi over period. In this case, you see this beautiful bands and and the gray sh just shadowed region are the ba band gap for uh for light okay so this is a, like a, a, some examples of real photonic crystals and this photonic crystal uh, was fabricated in our lab uh in the group by uh Mikhail Ribin yeah we have uh, a special setup like a 3D nanoprinter. Uh, so uh, it uses like a la laser light for polymerization of polymers. And in, exactly when we have a, a focus spot of the laser beam, we have a sample of polymerization. And then you could like uh, draw in space uh, uh, by this uh, laser beam and can just plot any 3D uh, distribution. Yeah, for example, like this one, atomic crystal. This is a characteristic scale is five microns. Here, this is a one micron. It's real 3D structure, like a 3D photonic crystal. Yeah. So, and actually, uh, th there are many photonic crystals in nature. So, and usually, if we see some beautiful color, yeah. Uh, and you can see that this sometimes this color can depends on the angle of view, yeah. So like a compact disc, yeah. Uh, we see some uh, like composition of several beautiful colors. You can be sure that not the that the origin of this color is not chemical. It's like geometrical or physical. Uh, it's photonic crystal. And for example, if we consider uh, the butterfly, yeah, uh, this blue one, and this color comes because of the nanostructuring, nano yeah. Let me have a look at, at the microscope. Uh, you see, uh, you see some uh, like a periodic array of lines, yeah, some periodicity, yeah. But if we zoom, yeah. This is an electron microscope, so this is a uh, two thousand times closer, yeah. And you see, and we see a real periodic structure, real periodic structure. And this is a uh, the characteristic scale one micron, one micron. We see this periodic, like one one D periodicity, periodicity in one dimensional, yeah. This is just a real butterfly, yeah. Okay, uh, this is a, uh, an, an another example, yeah, this compact disc, yeah, we uh, can observe this re re rainbow reflectance, and this rainbow reflectance also comes uh, through the periodicity, yeah, because it works like a, a diffraction grating, and, uh, and you know that the angle of diffraction depends on the wavelength, yeah, if you have a several wavelength, Diffraction angle for each wavelength is different, and uh, we can decompose incident light into the spectrum. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is like a uh, color of box. Yeah. If you consider like uh, external shield of, of box, we see that also they have very similar rainbow reflectance. And this also comes uh, through the periodic structure of the shield, yeah. This one, this one, very beautiful. Yeah, and this is their like microscopic image of the, of, of the shield, yeah. 
we see is also like per real per periodic, real periodic. This is our example of stones, yeah, and uh, so called uh, apale. In opals, uh, it, this is an image of, of real opal, and we see the many beautiful colors like green, blue, red. And uh, if you will change angle of view, you will see some change in uh, uh, in color. It's just because of the uh, band gap position, spectral position of the band band gap depends on the propagation angle. Yeah. So for different angle of incidence the position of the band gap a little bit different. That's why we have uh, can have a, ch a changing in color yeah, in this case. And opal, this is a ch chemical formula of opal. Yeah. It's just, uh, just a glass. Yeah. These are some atoms of water. Yeah. So this is a, another very beautiful example. This is a berry. And this is called marble berry in Russian, like Mramarne Yagada. See, this is a, also beautiful color of, of, of this berry. Uh, it looks like a real stone, not, not like a berry. But if, if you consider microscopic image of, 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 the, of this berry, of the skin of this berry, we see that it consists of many layers uh, of 1D structures, also real periodic. And, uh, and you know that if you consider, uh, usually if you consider like a dry berry, yeah, uh, after drying, berries lose, lose color, yeah, but, but this berry uh, doesn't lose color even uh, uh, after drying, yeah, because the nature, origin of this color is geometrical, yeah. Okay, uh, so there are two reasons, but, but actually I think even more. Uh, I would say like maybe three reasons for color, like a chemical, yeah, uh, uh, like a nanostructure, nanostructuring, and also I think I would say uh, re resonance. It's also like a geometrical because sometimes uh, we can incorporate, for example, into the glass some very small resonant particles. Uh, it's not necessary to have them periodic. Uh, dependence here, yeah? but uh, it's necessary to have like a small particles. Uh, simple example, clouds, yeah? Why uh, clouds, why are clouds white? Any ideas, guys? Do you know why? Uh, sky is blue, but uh, clouds are white. Uh, because clouds consist of uh, really dispersed uh, particles of water and they disperse the light in the way where we can see only, well, the whole spectre, so the white light, I guess. Yes, you're right, but what, what, what is the reason? Why? Why do they white? Because uh, the light dispersed so many times that it uh, just interfere with each other and we see all the dispersion as a white noise, literally. Uh, uh, almost, almost, but so, uh, why the sky is blue? Uh, because, uh, I guess, because of the chemical structure of our air, no. maybe? No, it's not. It's no, not it's Rayleigh scattering. Exactly, it's Rayleigh scattering, and re and so we will uh, uh, analyze Rayleigh scattering in two lectures. Yeah, uh, but what is really Rayleigh scattering? It's scattering on small particles. Yeah, and if the part if the particles is much much smaller than the wavelength, in this case, uh, scattering is more efficient for shorter wavelength. It means that blue color scatters more efficiently than uh, red color yeah for example if you have a sunset at the sunset uh, blue color uh, is scattered blue light is scattered and we see like like a blue uh, sky but red co red photons are scattered not so efficiently that's why we see uh, our sun as red yeah but uh, so the color 
depends on the, which photons are scattered more efficiently. But in clouds, you're absolutely right, there are many particles of different sizes, and sizes of these particles are comparable with the wavelength. In this case, we have so-called mirror regime of scattering. When we have a mirror regime of scattering, the, uh, uh, the color of photons, which, which are scattered more efficiently, depends on the size of the particle. For example, some particles scatter green light more efficiently, some particles scatter uh, uh, red light more efficiently, but we have all possible particles, all possible sizes. In this case, we have just very strong scatterer at all possible wavelengths in the spectrum. It is why we have like white, uh, the spectrum of scattered light is, is, is white, yeah. It's like if you have any form, yeah, if you have a, like a beer, if you have a form, it looks like a white. Why it is white? Because it scatters light efficiently in the whole visible range. Because we have uh, many different sizes uh, of thickness of films, thin film, thicker film. Uh, so it is why we have efficient scattering in the whole visible range. Any questions? Okay, let me go further. And this is a, uh, mm, mm, and another example, so uh, so called stain, stained glass on, in Russian vitrage, uh, stained glass window, uh, and why you know that uh, colors uh, are not changed for, for for centuries, yeah, or for ages, yeah. Uh, why? It's it's not a chemical here. It's not a chemical reason of color. Uh, this region is also so-called resonant because inside the glass uh, here we have some uh, metal particles so like plasmonic particles you see the characteristic size is just several nanometers like two three or five uh, nanometers so here we have a, a, like a several nan nanometers and the scattering is resonant so uh, for this, in spite of the fact that the particles are very small, they have some resonances at the visible range. Uh, for example, and this resonance also depends on the size of the particle. And if we can inc incorporate in uh, one part of, of the glass the sm smaller particle and uh, to the other part of the, of the glass, like a bigger particle, particles, we will have different colors. Yeah, and uh, af during the preparation, the size of the particle can be controlled by temperature or, so or something like this. This is a Le Mans Saint Michel AB in France. So uh, in, in this case, if, if uh, you, should, you would like to have like a permanent, permanent color, it's possible to print particles of different sizes and you can have, control the color by uh, miscattering by the size of the particle, yeah? For example, this is like a, uh, I would say, meta surface, yeah? Consisting of uh, different uh, particles, the size is different, yeah? And, and you could, changing the thickness, for example, of some layers, you could control uh, the scattered light, the, the spectrum of scattered light. And, and you could control the color, yeah. You see, this is just a quite a recent technology, like th three years ago. Yeah. Another beautiful example is chameleon. And, uh, and this paper uh, was published just, as I remember, five years ago. And uh, people just uh, understood the reason uh, how chameleon can change its color just five years ago. So it's quite re very recent result. Uh, because uh, originally uh, people can, uh, uh, thought that the chameleon, the origin of the color is chemical, yeah? It's, it, it happens for, uh, for some fishes, yeah? Uh, chem chemical nature of color. But for chameleon, the uh, origin of, of, of the colors it's geometrical because this skin of 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 
the chame of chameleon is a photonic crystal. It's real photonic crystal. If you like uh, have a look at the structure, we see uh, that uh, this skin has several layers, several rays, and each layer of the skin is a real photonic crystal. We have some peri periodic array of some uh, like particles, I would say particles, yeah. Uh, uh, the characteristic uh, scale bar here is like a one micron, yeah. And chameleon can uh, change its color by changing the period, period of this photonic crystal. So he can uh, like extend or shrink its, its skin, yeah. And you know what, what, uh, what are the simplest experiment uh, confirming that the origin of the chameleon's uh, color uh, of the, uh, the color of uh, chameleon skin is uh, geometrical is photonic crystal any ideas how to prove this is uh, not a chemical but <clears throat> geometrical structured color Guys, I, I need the feedback. I cannot see your, your faces. I cannot hear you. Because we're trying to uh, make a believable version because I literally can't. So maybe he's changing nanoparticles in, in its skin so the light would reflect in a different way so we could see uh, different colors or whatever. You need just to stretch chameleon. Take a head, take a tail, and stretch, and stretch it. <laughs> of course, and it's, uh, it's I also think... change the color. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Exactly. You need just to change the period. Oh, actually, uh, you can just uh, press on the skin. Just... And uh -huh. during the press, uh, pressing, uh, you will change the period locally. And, and you can change the color locally. But I thought that the chameleon changes its color um, because of it's afraid of something like this for the hiding reasons. Exa of course, not only, uh, you're right. It's, uh, it's uh, for, uh, for, for mimicration, yeah. But uh, the origin, uh, okay, it's like uh, evolution. But how he can do this? Chameleon changes the period of the photonic crystal. Yeah? Oh, because of the stretching of, of, of its skin. Uh, sorry, but uh, didn't people try to touch chameleons before? Yes, but uh, I think uh, they tried, but they uh, really didn't understand the, uh, this niche, analyze its skin. Moreover, it's interesting that, uh, as I said, chameleon skin uh, has several layers, and some layers are tuned to infrared spectrum, not to the visible. It means that chameleon can control the uh, reflectance spectrum in infrared. Why it, uh, chameleon needs this? In, uh, and uh, scientists think this is just to control uh, the uh, t uh, heating exchange with the environment. Because if you can control the, the reflectance of your skin in infrared region, you could control the temperature of your body. Or probably visibility for IR sensors or cameras. Something like this also, yeah. Because maybe uh, some predators can uh, see in the uh, infrared, and if you would like to mimic not only in the visible and also in infrared, so it's also possible to control the reflectance in this part of the spectrum. Okay. So, and I think this is like some video, yes, 2015, like five years ago. Let's have a look. Here at the right 
uh, bottom corner, you see the original color, like green, and now it's yellow, you see? Chameleon change, uh, changes his color again. It's original green, and now it's like yellow, it's blue. Mm -hmm. And another video. Like a microscopic structure, microscopic structure. See real, this is a kind of one seat of the skin. Originally it, it was red, but after changing the period, it becomes green, yeah, this part. This is characteristic scale 200 microns, you see. So it means that of, of photonic crystals are everywhere, even in nature, yeah. But actually, this uh, band gaps and this beautiful effects comes uh, through the periodicity, yeah. But actually, we can introduce a periodicity for any waves, for electronic wave, real crystals, for electromagnetic waves, like a photonic crystal. But for example, mechanical waves, sound, it's also a wave, yeah? And we can introduce periodic structure for sound. In this case, uh, uh, we say a phononic crystal, because a phonon is a quasi particle of sound, of vibration, yeah? like a photon quasi-particles of electromagnetic energy, phonon is a quasi-particle for mechanical energy. In this case, we could have like a phononic crystal. We could have a stop band uh, or band gap for acoustic waves. Or, yeah, and this is uh, some experiment, like a, ten, uh, like a physical review letters, like uh, 10 years ago. This is just an array uh, of cans from uh, Coca-Cola. And this is periodic array. And here in this paper, in physical review paper, people measured, uh, scientists measured uh, the band gap. Band gap for real uh, phononic, uh, phononic crystal. Yeah. Okay. Also, the thread uh, of uh, spider net is also, uh, it also has some periodic structure. And quite recently, like uh, several years ago, it was shown that uh, it's also the structure of thread is also periodic. And this thread, uh, this thread have some band gaps for sound. Yeah. And uh, scientists uh, do not know why the spider need this, but uh, they can measure this uh, band gap for sound in threads of spiders, yeah. So, uh, or in another example, like a s seismic waves, yeah. It's also waves and it's quite dangerous, especially in some region, uh, in, in Japan, for example. But you can also arrange some periodic array of obstacles and these obstacles uh, can have like a, a band gap for seismic waves. So it means that you could surround some city by this periodic array of, uh, of some obstacles and seismic waves cannot penetrate to some specific region. For example, this is like a result of simulation. This is in physical review letters paper, like uh, six years ago. Uh, this is a source of seismic waves here, yeah? and this is a, uh, surrounded by some periodic structure. Yes, of course, the wavelength is quite length here, yeah? and uh, we see that uh, here the color shows the amplitude of seismic oscillations, and we see that, despite the fact that here we have a source, yeah, here we have uh, like a periodic array, this blue. Yeah, uh, not blue, like white points. This is obstacles. And we see that 
uh, seismic waves uh, do not penetrate to the uh, this region where we have a band gap. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's one possible way to protect some cities from seismic waves. Okay. That is all. Uh, a a any question regarding the uh, this presentation? I have one question uh, on a slide where we have, um, how to say, uh, dispersion graphics. Uh, it's something in the beginning. Yes. Here? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, can you please, how to say, uh, describe a little bit uh, two graphics for uh, photon in periodic dielectric what is the gray lines and yes. why do this I have a, two graphics? This is a topic of, of the today's lecture. Today we will rigorously get this dispersion and we will start from Maxwell's equations and we will introduce the dispersion of waves in periodic structure. And we will get exactly this dispersion, okay? Okay, and why do we have two dispersions, two graphics? Why uh, is there, actually, this uh, is just equivalent? A, this is two possible way for, for presentation. So uh, you can uh, retrieve, uh, you can retrieve the dispersion if you have only this figure or this figure, doesn't matter. Yeah, mm -hmm. like it's just a, a completely identical dispersion, but like a different form of representation. Okay, okay got it. Thank you. So uh, let me. Let me open in th this presentation. So this is like a, a, a photonic crystal, yeah, the third part. So and we will start from the break reflector and all the physics could be introdu introduced in uh, for one, one D periodic structure. Yes, periodic and one dimensional. Then we introduce like a T matrix method. Uh, we will discuss the photonic band gap. Uh, I think we will skip this. Uh, uh, like a photonic structure, like 2D and 3D photonic structures. And we will analyze more detail some band gaps and introduce like effective medium approximation, like a transition from photonic crystal to metamaterials. Okay, uh, let's start. D definition, definition of, of uh, photonic crystal. Like uh, photonic crystal is just a periodical structure, but what is important is that the period should be comparable with the wavelength of incident light, yeah? And uh, in the general case, you see that epsilon is a periodic function in three dimensions, you know, along x, along y, along z, yeah? So if you have a periodicity in three dimensions, like here, yeah, we have per periodicity along x, along y, and along z. In this case, we say like a 3D photonic crystal. Here, we see the uh, periodicity in uh, two dimensions. So in one dimension, we have a, a translation symmetry. Yeah, along the wires, we have a translation symmetry. But in two perpendicular directions, we have a periodicity. This is like a 2D photonic crystal, yeah? And here we have a translation symmetry in two directions and periodicity in one direction. In this case, we have like a one D photonic crystal. Yeah. Okay, I think it's clear. This is just some examples of one D photonic crystal. Yeah. This is a structure from our recent paper. This structure was fabricated in Denmark Technical University. Uh, this is like a 2D photonic crystal, like an array of wires. And this is like 3D photonic crystal, opal, yeah. Okay. This is, a, a, as I said, this is a structure was fabricated in, uh, in, in our laboratory. Real photonic crystal. This is this paper from like five years ago. Um, so the role of periodicity, uh, uh, as I said, is, is quite clear. If you have a periodic potential, in the periodic potential, we have 
uh, allot band and band gap. So here the shaded region is allot band and white regions are the band, band gaps. Okay, and we can control the position of the band gap changing the period or shape of, of, of the potential. Mm -hmm. So, and, and let's try to um, mathematically describe this uh, 1D periodic structure. Uh, and we start with just multi-layer structure. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's periodic, it's just uh, uh, the structure consisting of many, many layers. Could be like an infinite stack of some dielectrics or metals, yeah? And what we know, we know that, uh, guys, uh, how we got the solution uh, for Fresnel problem? Could you describe the algorithm for Fresnel problem? What we did? What is the general idea to solve uh, the problem in, in multi-layer structure? Is to find the coefficient of uh, well of different of difference between uh, the inner and outer layer. Mm -hmm. So we could find the, um, I guess, the angle where we have a full internal reflectance. Yes, but I am asking you about some, some general thing. Uh, 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 if you have like a, a two media, two contact media, like in free mail problem, just to, you need to find the uh, reflection from some plane interface breaking to the electrics. Uh, how did we solve this problem? We use boundary condition, Maxwell equations and so okay, on. Okay, Maxwell's, okay, just a moment. But, uh, how did we use the boundary conditions? Before boundary conditions, what we did before boundary, applying the boundary conditions? We need to apply boundary conditions uh, f uh, to something. Yeah, to surface. A at the surface, but we need some solutions. We, we, we applied boundary conditions in order to find some constant. But, but uh, first we should define like what waves do we have? Like, Where? Uh, in the media. In which media? In the second. Like if, if the first is, uh, um, I in don't know. Each media, in each medium independently. Yeah. First we need to find like a general solution in each medium. In the medium number one, Assuming that this medium like infinite, yeah? And we have, for example, two waves propagating in, in opposite directions, yeah? In, in, in this medium, then this medium, this medium. And then at each interface, we use the boundary conditions to match uh, the waves in the neighboring uh, media, yeah? So in this case, uh, let me uh, assume that, and we know that because of this structure is multi-layered, uh, we have a, at each interface, we have a conservation of in-plane in plane momentum. Yeah, is it clear? So that uh, in-plane component of the wave vector is the same for each media and for each interface it conserves. So in, in, in my case, like a KX is the same for, for all media. Is it clear guys? Yes. Okay. So it is why I can, uh, I will not write this common factor. Of course, I, it, I will also, as well, I have some conservation of frequency yeah, for each layer. Initial, it's uh, we have the wave of with the same frequency. It is why I will not write here like a minus i omega t then plus i k x x. So okay. But k z 
in different media uh, is different. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me write the expressions for the uh, tangential components of electric and magnetic field. Like, uh, let's say that <clears throat> I, I will have like S polarization. Yeah. So I, I have like X component of electric field and Y component of magnetic field. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and here, inside this medium, I have two waves propagating in two different directions. Yeah. So uh, please uh, uh, take your pens or pencils and try to, to write it together with me because I will give you small exercises now. So uh, X component of the electric field, tangential component, is just uh, the consists of two waves with, with amplitude a plus and a minus. The, these are the waves propagating in the opposite directions. Yeah, and also uh, for magnetic field. Yeah, H Y. It's also some amplitudes b plus and b minus. But of course, uh, I can show that because these are the same wave. For example. Uh, like EKZZ and IKZZ. This is uh, the same wave, and this is an electric amplitude of electric and magnetic field of the same wave. Of course, they uh, they are uh, connected to each other. Yeah, there is a relation, and of course, the ratio of EX and HY. This is just an impedance, and this is a this relation. If we deal with TM polarization, this is a uh, just it, it's stri straightforwardly follows from Maxwell's equations that this ratio is just kz over epsilon k node. Yeah. And for TE waves, uh, we have another ratio like the k node over kz. Okay. Uh, so, and in each medium, we can write these amplitudes. Yeah. These amplitudes. Uh, okay, and then, guys, let me uh, introduce. Oh, I have, we have a question, yeah, in chat. Uh, I have a question. Can we extend the matrix method to solve problems in different coordinate systems, like a spherical, cylindrical scattering form? Exactly. Like a the matrix method is quite general. Here, I introduced the matrix method only for. Uh, for planar case, yeah, but actually, uh, what is T matrix? Uh, and uh, T matrix is uh, matrix which provides some connection of amplitudes of tangential field at one interface with the amplitudes of of the field of tangential field at another interface. In this case, this is a planar interfaces. In this case, uh, the matrix will connect this field in the interfaces z equal to zero and z equal to h1. Yeah, but in principle, it could be spherical or cylindrical. It doesn't matter. We need just, but in this case, we, we will uh, we, we'll deal with uh, the uh, cylindrical or spherical waves. It will provide some connection of amplitudes for spherical or cylindrical waves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, guys, let me introduce here to substitute z equal to zero. Yeah. In this case, x component of the electric field will be given as a, a plus plus a minus. It's here. You see. So it means that the total tangential component of the electric field at this interface. Okay. And the same story for the magnetic field, H, H Y. Here, uh, because we have a connection uh, between uh, electric and magnetic field, I can write that 
total magnetic field at the upper interface, it's A plus over Z minus A minus over Z. Whereas that for TM polarization, you should take this impedance. For T wave, you should take this impedance. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and this is a for Z equal to zero. And now let me uh, consider, I know the total electric and total magnetic field, the tangential components at the upper interface. But let me write the amplitudes at the second interface when Z equal to H, H1. Like here, yeah? You see that uh, electric field is like A plus. I just substitute H1 instead Z. And here also H1 instead Z. And for magnetic field, the same story. And we see that uh, here, electric and magnetic field at the upper interface are defined through the constant A plus and A minus, where A plus and A minus are the amplitudes of the wave traveling to the opposite directions. Yeah. But here also, the X and Y components of the electric and magnetic field respectively are the functions of uh, A plus and A minus. Yeah. It means that actually, if we know the uh, thickness of my layer, angle of incidence, I can uh, write an expression, for example, for these components of electric and magnetic field through these components, because they're connected with the same amplitudes. OK? Guys, please. Uh, could you get rid of amplitudes A plus and A minus? And could you write uh, the expression for X and Y component of the electric and magnetic field at H1 yeah, through the electric and magnetic field at the uh, upper interface when Z equal to zero? Is it clear? Uh, yes. Yeah. Please uh, try to solve, and uh, if you will have the, the result, just raise your hands. I give you like five minutes. So, as I understood, uh, we just uh, multiply H, H Y by Z, and then uh, if we sum E X with uh, Z H Y. <laughs> we get uh, two A plus, and if we, uh, which that, <laughs> uh, we get uh, two A minus. And what the final result? What is uh, E X? For example, could you, uh, what the expression for E X at the point H1? Um, okay. Um, a X at point zero plus HY at point zero mu multiplied by Z, everything divided by two, mm -hmm. multiplied by exponent plus, and plus uh, AX minus HY multiplied by Z divided by two, mm -hmm. uh, and everything multiplied by exponent uh, minus. Okay, it's, it looks like correctly. Okay, and this is, a, I think it's the same answer. Let, let me show you. So this is the answer. So this expression for EX and for HY uh, at the point uh, when Z equal to H. So we see that uh, it's, it's like a, we have some linear relation between EX and HY here uh, at this interface. If you know that EX and uh, HY at the original interface. We can combine exponential function into the cosine and sine functions. It's like a general expression. 
check, uh, Oli, check it, please. Do you have the same? I have the same. But okay. yeah, it's correct. It's correct. That, okay. So, just, just a just short exercise, yeah? So, and this is a, guys, uh, this matrix which connects amplitude of tangential electric component uh, of electric field and one interface to the tangential component of the electric and magnetic field uh, at another interface, this matrix is called T matrix. Yeah, T matrix. In general case, it could be introduced uh, in scattering theory for spherical particles, for cylindrical particles, but this is a just a quite standard uh, uh, case of planar interfaces. Yeah. And this is a, uh, for example, T matrix for T, TM and T polarizations. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is important? Let imagine that you know, you see that the T matrix is a function only on the thickness, yeah, H, KZ. But if you know omega and uh, kx, kx it's uh, like a, a tangential component of wave vector, which is the same for all layers. You can find kz in any layer. Yeah, if you know omega and k and uh, kx, you can find kz thickness, and this is just parameters of, of the layer, like a epsilon. Okay, so. It means that it's not it's not a problem to find T matrix for any layer, yeah. And for example, T, mat T matrix for layer one helps you to find if you know the tangential component of uh, E X and H Y here. It could be, for example, let me let me consider that I have some incident plane wave here, yeah. If it's just incident wave, it means that you know of course, the uh, tangential component of the incident wave, yeah? Okay, and T matrix help, uh, helps you to find tangential component in this interface, yeah? But if I would like to find the tangential component, uh, components not at this interface, but I would like to find it at this interface, what should I do? If I would like to find the tangential component at the Z equal to H2. We should do the same steps. Yeah, we should take the uh, tangential components here, but I know these components, then multiply these components by T matrix of the second layer, and you can have here, yeah, tangential components here. But actually, you can change the thickness H, and you could, for example, you can take not Z equal to H2, you can take, for example, Z equal to some value uh, less than H2. In this case, you could find the uh, value of electric and magnetic field in, at any position inside the layer, yeah? Because H is just a variable. You can take like H equal to, for example, here, 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 and but when the Z equal to H2, it will be, the uh, full layer, yeah? Okay, it means that if you would like uh, to find T matrix for multi-layer structure consisting of many layers, uh, T matrix for multi-layer structure is just a multiplication of T matrix for each layer. Because if, if you would like to find uh, value of tangential components here, you need uh, to know the tangential components here, and they give the multiplication of T matrix like T2. But in order to find these tangential components here, you need to, mu to multiply tangential components here. So it's result in this multiplication rule. Uh, guys, please uh, find, for example, determinant, a determinant of uh, T matrix. Let's calculate cosine cosine square minus sine square and here 
I epsilon k node. It what will be equal to one. Exactly. It's equal to one. And this is just because of all of the uh, co uh, energy conservation. Energy conservation. Uh, it's true if uh, the, uh, there is no no loss. In this case, determinant of T matrix is one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and what is interesting, yeah, uh, you, we know that determinant of multiplication of serial mat mat matrices is equal to the determinant or to multiplication of determinants. And we see that this expression is consistent. Yeah, because determinant of full T matrix also one and for each of these matrix also one. Okay, is it clear? So, and now uh, we will use a block theorem. So this is, uh, T matrix could be introduced for any multi-layer structure. It's not necessary uh, to have some periodic structure, but now I will consider, uh, I will consider a periodic structure. And this periodic structure uh, the period will consist of two layers, like D1 and D2. Yes, th th these are the thickness of these layers. Epsilon 1, Epsilon 2 are permittivities. And the total period, the period of the structure is D. Yeah? And I know that in this, uh, in this medium, yeah, the solution should be uh, can be represented uh, as a Bloch function, yeah. So I need to find the uh, electric field, yeah. It's a vector electric field as a function of uh, x, y, and z variable. My structure is periodic along the z direction. It is why. Uh, it could be represented as e to the i k b z. This is a just uh, envelope function, yes, Bloch function, Bloch, Bloch exponential function. Okay, multiply by uh, by the periodic function of z. U capital is a vector function, and this function is periodic function of z variable. Yeah. And this function u, it, it also depends on kb. kb is just Bloch wave number. Bloch wave number. And what is n, guys? No. Number of cell. Mm. Guys, uh, did you? have the block theorem in quantum mechanics? Yes, but yeah. That's great. So you know that if you have periodic potential and periodic potential, your solution could be written in the form of block wave, uh, block solution. And, uh, and this solution has exponential factor like envelope function, KB is a block wave number. Uh, and n, uh, n u function is periodic function. It also depends on k b and n when n is an additional uh, quantum number, which is called number of the band. It's a band number. It's an integer one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Yeah. Okay, and here, because, because we have a translation symmetry along x and, and, and along y directions, I can write like i k y and i k x x here, yeah? And just because of translation, translation symmetry. Okay, this is so-called my ansatz. Uh, of course, if we will write here dependence on time, I should write here e to minus i omega t. 
yeah? Okay, and how many constants uh, do I have? Let me count. Okay, K, uh, frequency omega. Okay, frequency omega. Uh, Kx, Ky, Kb, and an integer n. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Five constants, omega, three uh, wave numbers, Kx, Ky, Kb, and an integer, okay? Okay, uh, can we find non-trivial solution for Maxwell's equations in such a form? The answer is positive. Yes, we can find the solution in this form, but only if omega kx, ky, k, kb, a n uh, will satisfy to some equation. So it's possible, but not for arbitrary kx, ky, k, kb, and, and n. It's possible only for specific parameters. And uh, if they satisfy to some equation. And this uh, equation is called dispersion equation, yeah? And we need to find the dispersion equation in order to find the dependence. For example, uh, it was a question from Olya that uh, how we can find this dispersion, like a L band or a band gap. So it's just a function of omega as a function of KB. Yeah? If you put, for example, KX, KY equal to zero, yeah, like a normal incidence, if kx, ky is zero, it's normal incidence, yeah? Uh, we can find the, the de uh, dependence omega as a function of kb for different uh, n, for different uh, bands. Okay, uh, the function u is periodic in space, yeah? And omega, uh, you know, we know that omega is a function of kb. It's also a periodic function in the reciprocal space. And period is 2 pi m over d, where, where d is a period. Uh, and we know that uh, if I have the periodic structure, I know that if I add period d to z, yeah, electric field is not periodic function. Yeah, my potential is periodic, but electric field solution is not periodic. We see that it's not periodic function. It has some periodic part, like function u, but it also has this exponential factor, you see? And let me substitute, guys, let me substitute uh, z plus d instead z. What I will have in this case? I will have i to the uh, e to the i k b z function u the same, and z plus d here uh, is just u function again because it's periodic. Yeah. So, and in this case uh, here I have x y. It's the same. Yeah. And also, it means that the only change is a new factor. What is the factor? E in the power of i, k, b, d. Yes, e to the i, k, b, d. Exactly. This is what I have here, yeah? Uh, so the solution is almost the same, it has only an additional factor, okay? So, but from other hand, if I know the tangential component of electric field here, I can find the uh, tangential comp uh, components of electric and magnetic field here using the T matrix, yeah? Okay, so, uh, this is a T matrix of the first layer. Yeah. See, cosine, cosine, and uh, here KZ1 is just a Z component of the uh, 
Okay, this is a T matrix of the first layer. This is a T matrix of the second layer. So this is a, if we multiply these two T matrix, I will have T matrix for the period. And if I, I will apply this uh, T matrix for the period to the value of um, tangential components of electric and magnetic field at one interface, I will have uh, the value of electric and magnetic field at the another interface through the period, yeah? But according to the block theorem, it should be the same, yeah? But with this factor. Can you see this? Yeah. So, what is interesting? So, uh, this is some matrix. This matrix affects some vector, yeah? And as an answer, you have the same vector, but with, a, with a some factor. Is it, do you have any ideas? What is it? It's, it's well, well known. Yeah. Obvious. When you affect by some metric, by some operator to some vector, and the result is the same vector, but multiple, multiplied by some number. It's eigen uh, value and eigen vector. Exactly. So we see that uh, this vector should be like an eigen vector of my problem. Yeah. And this IKBD, this is a, a eigen value of, uh, of, of my operator, of my matrix. And it, it's possible, so, uh, okay, we can then rewrite this matrix equation in the following form. We could put the right part to the left part, yeah? And, and uh, we have just one matrix. And we could write the uh, characteristic equation, yeah? like a, a matrix of this operator minus unit matrix multiplied by lambda. And then we can calculate the determinant and then we can find the expression for lambda. Okay. Okay. Uh, next exercise. Could you just multiply these two matrices, please? This one and this one. So this is the answer. So, uh, so it depends. It's for you. It may be beautiful or not. So, uh, uh, but for me, it looks very beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do we have the same answer? Check it, please. Yes. Okay. Uh, what is important then? So I just write this matrix in a short way. Yeah. This one. Yeah, so this is like a T11, this is this one, it's T22, okay. And what can we say, for example, about, about this one? Let me have a look. What is it, guys? Determinant? It's yeah. one. It's one, beautiful. Okay, and what is T11 plus T22? Trace. It's a trace, beautiful. Okay, I can rewrite this equation like a lambda square, lambda square minus lambda, like a trace of uh, T matrix, yeah, and uh, plus one and equal to zero. This is my uh, equation for lambda. And the only thing I need to do is just to find, uh, to find lambda. For example, uh, I need just to find lambda from here, yeah? Uh, I have two roots like lambda one and lambda two, yeah? Uh, what can you say about the multiplication of this lambda? What is a multiplication? One. 
exactly it's one and i know that my lambda it follows from here my lambda is i k b d yeah so lambda one let's say lambda one is i or e two three i k b d maybe let me write this here yeah so that lambda one the one is t i k b d yeah it's lambda one but it means that but what is lambda two in this case the same but negative exactly with negative power yeah like me the, it means that my roots uh, in general case they are uh, conjugated yeah because the determinant is equal to one yeah conjugated that's great that's great okay uh and what is okay and it's lambda two and if, if i will take the sum of lambda one and lambda two what is equal to sum of lambda one and lambda two grace it's a it's exactly a trace yeah it's uh, minus the second coefficient it's trace so let me write this so uh It's a trace. Where is the trace here? Yeah, it's a trace. Yeah, and what is there? What is the sum? The sum of two co conjugated exponential it's functions. Cosine. It's, it's double. Two. It's cosine with. Factor two, two multiplied by cosine. Exactly. So it's just a cosine, cosine KBD, or two cosine. Or maybe I'll write one over two. And here I should write like a trace. Yeah. So, and you found, so it means that you need only diagonal components, yeah? Or for T metrics. And these diagonal components, these are, this is a T11 and this is T22, yeah? Uh, okay. And this is exactly the dispersion equation. This is the dispersion equation, yeah, for, so because here we have, let me have a look. Here I have a KB, KB block wave number, okay. Uh, <clears throat> inside the trace, what I have? I have a KZ1, but what is KZ1? Uh, it's a Z component of the wave vector in the first layer. So it's k, let me say z one, maybe let me write uh, square. It's like a kx square, it's a tangential component, plus ky square, tangential component. Uh, ah, no, it's epsilon, I'm sorry. Uh, Epsilon omega square over c square minus kx square minus ky square. Please, please have a look. Uh, here in T metrics, I have kz1. What is kz1? kz1 square, it's a, a epsilon in the layer of number one. So let me write maybe epsilon one here. Yeah, it's epsilon one omega square over c square minus k x square minus k y square. Okay, so inside k z we have omega k x k y. So 
uh, it means that in this equation, I have omega kx, ky, kb. This is exactly the dispersion equation, yeah? So from, from this equation, I can find the uh, values of kb, ky, kx, and omega in order to have this non-trivial solution. So, um, this is exactly the dispersion equation. So, uh, one can find that you could multiply uh, the left and right part by two. In the left part, we will have uh, like a two cosine. Yeah, two cosine here. Then this is just a trace of scattering matrix. And actually this expression is uh, quite easy to remember because it's like a cosine kz1 d1, cosine kz2 d2, like cosine cosine, and here we have sine and sine. Yeah, sine sine. And minus one over two from this expression for TM polarization and for T polarization like here. Okay? Okay. Uh, <coughs> okay, guys, what can you say about uh, this trace? Could be like, could be more than one or something like this. No, because cosine is exactly. uh, a granitian function. Exactly. Because if the right part is more than one or less than minus one, in this case, KB uh, will be pure imaginary. Yeah, and cosine should be replaced by hyperbolic cosine. But if KB, KB is pure imaginary, let's have a look. Uh, let's introduce here pure imaginary KB. What will have in this case? Exponentially. Exponential behavior, yeah? Like, uh, uh, like un under the barrier, yeah? Under the barrier. Uh, in this case, uh, this is exactly the case of, of band gap because uh, if you have some exponential behavior of the function, uh, it means that you will have a total, total reflection. It's like uh, a plane wave uh, under the condition of total internal reflection. Inside the dielectric, you have exponential behavior, yeah? but total internal reflection. Okay, uh, let me plot maybe this, um, the right part as a function of uh, omega frequency. So I told you that in general case, uh, uh, Kz1, yes, please. Kz1, it's uh, epsilon, omega square over c square minus kx square minus K, ky square, yeah? But for simplicity, I can consider the case of normal incidence when kx and ky equal to zero, yeah? So I have like a normal incidence of propagation perpendicular to the layers, okay? Uh, in this case, uh, I can write like that, K1 is equal to N1 K node. Do you agree? Because where N1 is a square root from epsilon one. Yes. Okay, that's for simplicity. Uh, and it's, of course, if you consider the case of normal incidence, it will be no different, no difference between TE and TM waves. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me show uh, that there is no such a difference. Uh, what is epsilon two over epsilon one? It's just 
uh, n2 square over n1 square. Yeah? Here. Yes. Okay. Uh, but here, but, but kz1, as I, as I told you, it's just uh, n1 k node. So we have n1 square. Uh, n2 square n1 k node and here i have n1 square n2 k node uh, and and we can cancel out n1 and 2 so we have only n n2 over n1 plus n1 over n2 it is the same like here we see that these brackets are the same for the case of normal incidence and dispersion equations for TEM and T waves are the same because these brackets are the same. Okay. This formula was introduced first uh, by Ritov uh, more than half century ago, yeah, in, in 1956 in the Journal of uh, of experimental uh, journal of experimental uh, uh, I forgot this abbreviation just a moment I think this is a misprint journal of experimental and theoretical physics should be JEP Okay. Yes, Journal of Ex Ex Experimental and Theoretical Physics. Okay, and now let me put, as, as I told you, kx equal to ky equal to zero, and I will rewrite <coughs> the dispersion equation in the following form. Now it looks much more simple for normal incidence, cosine kb d cosine n1 d1 k node, cosine n2 d2 k node, uh, sine functions, and this bracket. Okay. And let me plot just the right part of this right part uh, of this equation as a function of k node, or as a function of frequency, yeah? This is a red curve. So the vertical axis is a frequency. It's like K node. Yes, yeah, so omega over C. Okay. And a red curve is just right part of, of this equation. And uh, dash lines are just shows us, uh, show us uh, minus one and one. Okay. Okay. Uh, and we see that the like amplitude of this function is uh, more than one. And there are some region where the red curve more than one or less, uh, less than minus one or more than one. Yeah. So in this region, KB is uh, pure imaginary, okay? And this is a frequency, okay? And and here at this plot, uh, at this figure, I show you the dependence of omega as a function of KB. So this is just a solution of this equation. So here I have KB and here, but actually guys, please have a look. What is KB? You can take R cosine from the left and right part. KB can, can be found analytically. Yeah. KB just uh, R cosine from this expression divided by D. So you could plot this uh, analytically. Yeah. So uh, and here, this is dependence of KB over D. Uh, 
and this is a uh, kb of, uh, this is a pi over d i mean this if it's kb oh this is the first brilliant zone because at the boundary of, 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 first, of the first brilliant zone kb equal to pi over d actually this is regarding the, the question uh, by olia that actually here the dependence of omega on kb is periodic you see that at the right part of my equation i have only periodic function of frequency yeah and also it's clear that uh, my omega is periodic function of kb over d because here i have a cosine So I could write here KB multiplied by D plus two pi M. Yeah, it means that I could add uh, two pi over two pi over D. I could uh, add these two pi over D to KB, it, it, and the result will be the same. So it's omega is periodic function of KB, but here if omega is, period, is periodic function of KB. It, it's not necessary to know to plot uh, it's everywhere. It's necessary to plot it only in the like uh, uh, at the values of KB where we have a period, only at the period. Okay. So what is important here? We see that if you, oh guys, it is important if you fix KB. No, well, let's say KB equal to zero, for example. Yeah. Uh, if uh, KB equal to zero, cosine equal to one, this is a one, and we see many solutions. You see, that at any value of KB, the vertical line crosses the red line in many points. And each crossing is a solution. And and I could count these solutions, <clears throat> these crossings, like a first crossing, second crossing, third, fourth, fifth, and so on and so forth. And these crossings are exactly this integer number n. I told you this is a number of, of the zone. So blue curve are the uh, dispersion. It's of omega as a function of uh, omega as a function of kb. And we have for x for each KB, I have uh, many solutions, uh, many bands. So this is a first band. This is a second band, blue curve. Yeah, third band, and uh, all the bands are separated by band gaps. And inside band gaps, we have uh, KB is pure imaginary, as I told you. Yeah. And what is it? Uh, remember, if uh, wave number is imaginary, I replaced this imaginary wave number k by kappa. What is kappa? What is physical meaning of kappa? It's like penetration length or something, no? Uh, yes, inverse penetration, inverse yeah. penetration depth, like I K Z is like uh, usually it's kappa. Exactly, uh, I K Z is kappa, and kappa is inverse uh, penetration depth. So if kappa is small, penetration depth is large, and vice versa. If if kappa is huge, is big here, yeah, uh, then penetration depth is very very small. So, and please have a look at the green curves. So inside the band gaps, uh, we have a pure imaginary uh, wave number, KB. So here, you could uh, think that I plot kappa here. Uh, and this, here we see that uh, the kappa is maximal in the center of the, of the band gap. So it means that in the center of the gap, on the band gap, penetration depth 
inside photonic crystal is minimal. Okay. What is also important here, we see they uh, at, in the center of the Brillouin zone at, at the boundary uh, of the uh, Brillouin zone, uh, the omega over dKb is zero. So the, we, here we have a zero group velocity in the center and at the so-called band edge. It's also called region called band edge. Okay, uh, now it, we will answer two questions. What is the position of the band gap, omega b? Let's imagine that your supervisor uh, asked, asked you, uh, okay, we have two materials, like with refractive index N1 and N2. Uh, I need to uh, fabricate one-dimensional photonic crystal uh, with the position of the band gap uh, at the wavelength lambda. Please find the, uh, the period of the structure D and thicknesses of each layer, D1 and D2. So how can we engineer the uh, photonic crystal yeah, in order to have the band gap uh, at the position that we need? And, and for example, uh, how can we maximize the uh, band gap, yeah? Or maybe uh, vice versa, can we squeeze uh, the band gap in order to have like a very narrow band gap? Okay, let's try to answer uh, this question. Let me analyze. Uh, but before this, uh, uh, let me show you uh, how the, this dispersion depends on the uh, permittivities, on the dielectric contrast. Of course, Guys, if the uh, epsilon one and epsilon two are the same, I have so-called homogeneous, homogeneous uh, uh, material, yeah, with a constant permittivity. It's not a periodic. It's not a real periodic structure. In this case, we see that I have so-called empty lattice. This is a when uh, the periodicity is infinitely small. Yeah. Uh, in solid state physics, we say empty lattice model. Yeah, it's a uh, periodic potential with uh, infinitely small amplitude. In this case, we have just a dispersion. Uh, it's linear dispersion, like in free space. But I have like a band. Uh, I have a brilliant zone because of the periodicity, and this is a like a just a straight line and no uh, band gap. Yeah. So if you increase the uh, contrast permittivity, here you have uh, a band gap. If you increase the contrast, you will see the in, uh, increasing of the of the band gap. Okay, and still here we have a linear dispersion. Yeah. So if the wavelength is big, so its frequency is very very small. Its frequency is small. Uh, uh, wavelength is huge, is much, wavelength is much bigger than the period in this region. We see that dispersion is linear, yeah? But what does it mean, guys, that dispersion is linear? I don't know the, the slope. So yeah, this, uh, what is, the slope is described by some uh, effective refractive index. If dispersion is linear, so it's important, guys. Uh, we have a real periodic structure, but the incident uh, wavelength of the incident light is much bigger than the period of the structure. And here, in this so region, does this mean that we have? Sorry, Ole, again, please. Uh, does it mean that we have a behavior like in free space? Uh, yes, but not in free space because I don't know the slope. Is any effect, if, if an effective is one, yes, it will be behavior like in free space. But if an effective is not one, it's a behavior like in some homogeneous dielectric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, not in free space, like, but like we don't have periodic structure. Yes, it means that 
uh, if the wavelength is much bigger than the period, photonic crystals behave like a homogeneous medium. It means that I can uh, describe my photonic crystal uh, with effective parameters, like some constant, like refractive index, something like this. Yeah. And this is exactly the case of metamaterials. So for metamaterials, uh, we could describe the propagation of uh, electromagnetic waves in metamaterials using effective parameters. Of course, in order to, we can calculate these effective parameters. For example, let's, we know that the accurate solution, this is a rigorous solution of my problem. In principle, I could consider the case of, of very small frequencies, of very small K nodes. I could expand this expression into the series. And then I can, uh, and after this expansion, I will see, I will get just a dispersion like in a homogeneous dielectric with some effective parameter. And this is a, a effective parameter. It's exactly that one of the problem in, in metamaterials physics. If you have a very complicated metamaterial, we need to calculate effective parameters of this medium. If a long wave limit uh, approximation. Okay. Uh, and this effective parameter could be calculated even for photonic crystal. And we will do this uh, today or maybe next lecture. <clears throat> so it means that here there is no information like a, about photonic crystal, about periodicity, because it behaves like a homogeneous medium. All the effects related to the photonic crystal uh, happens near the band gap, yeah, when we have uh, some unusual reflectance or transmittance, something like this. Okay, so now uh, let me uh, analyze the position of the of the band gap and the way how it's possible to find the position of the band gap and the way how it's possible to maximize this band gap. Okay. Uh, first, I will introduce this factor alpha, this bracket, yeah. When, the, when I have a normal incidence, yeah, when I have a normal incidence, I could rewrite my expression in, the, in this form, okay. How I can find the position of the band gap, guys? Where is it? Please have a look at, at the red curve and answer me where, where the center of my band gap. Exactly. So uh, we need to calculate derivative from this expression over by what? Red curve? Over co cosine. No, 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 not. Uh, we need to calculate derivative by which variable? Ah. Red curve is a uh, function. By, by omega. By omega, definitely, yeah. So let's do this, let's do this. Please calculate the derivative, but omega is k naught, yeah? It's omega over c. So we need to calculate derivative by k naught. From the only from the right part, yeah. Mm -hmm. But actually, before to calculate this derivative, uh, let me suggest to rewrite what is cosine cosine. Do you remember trigonometric relations? Cosine, cosine. Not really. Uh, cosine, cosine, it's one over two. One over two. Uh, cosine. I think it's like uh, cosine of sum plus cosine of uh, 
mine like разность difference of difference difference and uh, multiply by uh, one over two exactly thank you thank you okay uh, and what about sine and sine it's also one over two it's common factor but it's cosine of difference minus cosine of sum Mm -hmm. So let me multiply left and the right part by two. Yeah. So at the left part, I will have two cosine KBD. At the right part, I will have cosine of sum. Yeah. Plus cosine of difference minus alpha bracket uh, cosine of difference minus cosine of sum. So I have only cosines, okay? So in this case, uh, I can write one plus alpha multiplied by cosine of sum and plus one minus alpha is cosine of difference. Let me ch check me please. Exactly. This is just my function of KB K node, two cosine KBD and this after modification of my expression, yeah? Please uh, uh, raise your hand if you have the same answer. Let me maybe write here. Cosine x, cosine y. It's just, x plus y, x minus y, and sine sine, x minus y, my, x plus y. Mm -hmm, guys, I need to use just these formulas. Uh, can you open the presentation, please? Yes. <clears throat> guys, please, okay, uh, two answers. I need more people. Just to write using these two formulas for cosine and sine. Uh, I, I don't really understand why do we put two cosine to the right side to make one function. Okay, it's it, it's uh, it's okay. It's not necessary. Okay, we need just to to care about the right part. So, and next step. So, guys, uh, it's just very simple uh, exercise. You need to use these two formulas to substitute these two formulas to this expression. Okay, three hands, Victor. I see. Oh, many hands. Okay, this is much better. Okay. So, and now next step, uh, it's calculate the derivative over k node, yeah, from the, just from the right part. And what is interesting, uh, 
actually, guys, uh, you see the, this cosine function n1d1k node and 2d2k node. Actually, we have quite enough degree of freedom. And, uh, and usually people work with their uh, photonic crystal or multilayer structure when n1d1 exactly equal to n2d2. What is n1d1? What is the physical meaning of n1d1? Optical length. It's optical length in the first layer. And n2d2 is optical length in the second layer. And we work in, in, in usually in, in photonic crystal and break structures. The optical length of, uh, for each layer is the same. In this case, this cosine, just a constant. Yeah? Because these terms are the same. This constant. Uh, and k node is only here. And when we try to calculate the derivative, I need to calculate derivative only from this term. And this is just sine. Yeah? And n1 d1 equal to n2 d2, okay? It's just sine of 2 and 1 d1 k node. Yeah? So, and sine is equal to 0. So when n1 d1 plus n2 d2 is equal to pm over k node, yeah? Okay. And this is a uh, condition when the uh, right uh, term, this co uh, cosine, uh, okay, uh, in principle, you also can calculate the derivative here, here, you will have a sign. And the one of the solution, when both of this sign uh, are equal to zero simultaneously. It's just a particular solution, yeah? So, uh, not, not the, the, the general solution of, of the system. But we can put n1 d1 minus n2 d2 equal to pi m. So, in the simplest solution, and when n1 d1 equal to n2 d2. So, and we will satisfy the second equation. And then, in order to satisfy the first equation, I know that n1 d1 equal to n2 d2. I can solve this equation. And we see that n1 d1 equal to n2 d2 and equal to lambda over 4. So it means that uh, the central position of, uh, of the band gap is lambda b over 4, which is equal to n2 d2 or n1 d1. So if your supervisor, for example, asked you, uh, I, need a I need a photonic crystal uh, for example, you have two materials. Let's say n1 equal to 1.5 and n2 equal to 3.5. Yeah? Can you see my screen, guys? Yes. Yes. So you have uh, two materials. Let's say maybe um, silicon and silica. This is for silica 1.5, just a glass, and for silicon 3.5. And you need, let's say, uh, the band gap uh, at the wavelength, uh, I don't know, one micron. One micron. Okay. It's quite easy. You know that N1 D1, N1 D1 should be equal to lambda B over 4. It's like D1 should be equal to lambda over 4 is uh, 250 nanometers. Yeah. Uh, over 1.5. It's uh, one 
167 nanometers. It's for one layer. Yeah, it's like a D1. Yeah. And for the second layer, you can find like a D2, 3.5, 71 nanometer. So in this case, you, uh, you will have exactly, uh, so for such thicknesses, 167 and 71 nanometers, uh, you will have exactly the band gap of your photonic crystal at the wavelength equal to one, one micron. So this is a way how it's possible to engineer your, your photonic crystals. And this is so-called quarter wave condition. Yeah, quarter wave condition. Uh, I'm sorry, may I ask? Yeah, sure. I don't really understand why did we get lambda by four? Uh, yeah, I didn't realize why did we get lambda by four. Uh, okay, please have a look. I know that first, first I know that N1 D1 equal to N2 D2. Is it clear? Uh, yes. So it means that I uh, p is integer uh, and m is integer, but I I take uh, just p equal to zero. Mm -hmm. So it means that n one d one equal to n two d two. Okay, then I have here I write the sum n one d one plus n two d two. It's just two n one d one. Yes. Yes. Okay, and what is k node? K node it's two pi over lambda. Ah. Uh -huh. 2 okay. pi over lambda multiplied by 2 and 1 d1. Okay, equal, I got it. And, and here I put uh, m equal to 1, mm -hmm. equal, to, equal to pi. Uh, pi is cancel out, and you see that n1 d1 equal to lambda over 4. It, it's just solution of, of this equation. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, but if you know lambda, so it's not a problem to calculate the uh, frequency omega b, because uh, frequency is uh, omega uh, is uh, c over lambda b multiplied by two pi. Yeah, and this is exactly the uh, break frequency. So actually, it's quite easy to understand uh, this nature. Why exactly uh, we should take this lambda over four condition? Uh, it follows from the just standard diffraction theory. Let's imagine that this is a kind of atoms. Yeah, it's like atomic planes, atomic planes, and when we have the uh, like constructive ma maximum of reflectance yeah we have a maximum of reflectance when we have a constructive interference of uh, of two beams yeah it means that the difference in optical length should be equal to the integer number of lambda yeah and if you calculate uh, the reflectance from one layer and the reflectance from the second layer, the difference will be uh, exactly equal to uh, to this red uh, or pink uh, regions, yeah? Length of these pink regions. So D is a uh, distance between uh, two atomic planes. This is a theta and the length of this pink region is like uh, d multiplied by sine theta. It's two because it's the difference is you have two of these pink regions. Yeah, this is exactly this condition. Uh, so in my case, I have very similar story. Yeah, but it's even simple. Uh, because here I have a case of normal incidence, yeah? And 
in order to have the maximum uh, reflectance, maximum reflectance is exactly at the happens exactly at the condition of the uh, band gap. Yeah, at the at the frequency where I have a band gap. So I have I could represent my incident wave uh, as two waves. Yeah, one wave. Uh, reflects from the upper interface from here, yeah. yeah. And the second reflects uh, from the like next period, yeah. And I need to calculate the phase difference. And this phase difference should be equal to two, two pi, yeah. Th this phase. It means that uh, these two waves will interfere constructively, enhancing the reflectance. But what is the phase difference? I need to calculate uh, the phase difference because of the uh, optical path here, yeah? But this is exactly like 2K node because it's uh, one way and uh, back way. So this is a factor two. Uh, in the first layer, it's like, N1, D1, in the second layer, like N2, D2, yeah? It's an optical length, uh, optical thickness of, of my period, yeah? And this, uh, because of the round trip of this light, I should uh, put here the factor two. And this is exactly the, the condition of the uh, maximum reflectance. And in th this condition coincides with, with this condition, this quarter wave condition. Because I need to uh, to substitute here two pi over lambda, yeah, and I will have n one d one equal to n two d two, and I will have that n one d one equal to lambda over four. Is it clear, guys? Uh, yes. Why don't we uh, учитывать uh, reflectance from? Um, в общем, у нас же еще есть границы раздела n один и n два. Yes, you're right, but this is just an approximate method. So this is, uh, this, this is true, or, uh, this is applicable, this consideration, if the contrast is quite low, but approximately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, but this is just how to understand this condition, why lambda over four. This comes from this diffraction theory it's related to. But you, of course, you're right, it's, this is a, additional uh, reflectance and we solve this problem accurately yeah rigorously and we've got this lambda over four rigorously yeah but in order to uh, interpret uh, our results to interpret it yeah we we consider this uh, simplified example okay and this is a uh this is a calculation this is a uh, band structure yeah, of photonic crystal with if epsilon one equal to thirteen, epsilon two equal to eight. This is like a, a quarter wave Bragg reflector. Yeah, and this is a band gap, and this is a reflectance. So the vertical axis is the same; it's a frequency. Okay, a over over lambda, but it's the dimension less frequency. Yeah, and here we see that the reflectance uh, exactly equal to one in the region of the band gap. This is just analytical solution for reflectance. Okay. And here in the metamaterial regime or in the effective medium regime, we have uh, some non-zero reflectance here. Uh, but if you know the effective refractive index, yeah, I know that if you know the effective refractive index, you can use the Fresnel equations to calculate the reflectance. It's n effect n refractive index plus one, refractive index minus one, uh, and uh, square. But I think it's it seems that this is a mistake. It's uh, effective minus one divided by effective plus one because it should be less than one. Here I have a misprint, yeah? Okay, but uh, 
exactly in the uh, inside the band gap I have the unit reflectance so perfect reflectance it is why uh, for for example if we need to fabricate like a fabric resonator usually we, we use not the just the metallic mirror we use a break reflector mirrors so like two mirrors consisting of several layers we have several layers and in this case uh, you could tune your fabric resonator with these two mirrors by uh, the wavelengths that you need. Yeah. You could combine the condition of fabric resonator resonances with the condition when uh, you have the band gap exactly at the wavelength that you need. Okay. Okay. And and in diffraction theory in solid state physics, uh, you see if you rotate this by half of pi in space, you will see like, like a table, yeah? Just uh, some horizontal surface, uh, horizontal line. And in solid state physics, this is called like a table by Ewald. In Russian, stolik Ewalda. Это называется сто, ну если повернуть на пополам, все это называется столик Эвальда в теории дифракции. In photonic, uh, in photonics, it's uh, we uh, we don't call like a, a table by Eveld, just reflectance spectrum. Okay. Uh, how possible to calculate the uh, reflectance? So uh from finite photonic crystal yeah so let's imagine that we have like uh, some finite number of unit cells yeah i have some incident wave i have some reflected wave yeah and uh, let me show you how it's possible to do using the uh, t matrix method so we have a finite photonic crystal and unit cells. Of course, I know the tra uh, transfer matrix for each period. And I know the transfer matrix of my uh, crystal because if uh, it has n unit cells, it means n periods, the uh, total transfer matrix, it just, I need to take the matrix of, of, of one period, yeah? and multiply it by itself n times yeah okay <clears throat> uh <coughs> what is field uh, transfer matrix uh acts on the vertical uh on, on the vector consisting of tangential components yes tangential components of the electric and magnetic field let me ask you, what is the total uh, tangential electric and magnetic field here in the left region? What does consist of total electric field at this boundary? Like incident and reflectant exactly uh so it means that the uh, but incident m let me put amplitude of the incident field like one yeah if the amplitude of the incident uh wave is one so r is m is a just a, a complex uh reflection coefficient yeah and the total field is just one plus r yeah total electric field one plus r but if you calculate uh, the magnetic field uh, for the magnetic field I, I should write here minus r because magnetic field change its direction yeah or for the reflected wave it is why the amplitude is the same but here i should put right minus for the magnetic field so this is like a total electric field incident and reflected and this is magnetic field incident and reflected yeah but here uh what i have here at the right part of my photonic crystal 
only transmitted wave, yeah, T and T. This is a, like amplitude of uh, electric and magnetic fields. Okay. And, and I know, let's imagine that M is just N power of T matrix of one unit cell. So this is a linear system. This is the linear system. You can, uh, you have two equations, yeah, because this is a li uh, linear system of, uh, of two equations. And you can solve this linear system with respect to R and with respect to T. And this is a, just a solution, like uh, reflectance R, reflectance R, it's just square of the absolute value of the uh, 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 reflection coefficient, yeah? So and this, is this is just a solution. So it means that where M is the elements of this matrix. So it's quite easy to calculate n power numerically, yes? Yeah? So you could introduce like five periods, six periods, 10 periods, 100 periods, yeah, it's not a problem, numerically. And I did it. I just uh, wrote a MATLAB code and uh, I use the following parameters, n1 equal to one, n2 equal to 3.5. So it's like air and some high refractive index materials. I calculated uh, the N1, D1, N2, and D2 in order to have the uh, parameters of the, of the band gap at some certain wavelength. And this is the results of the simulation. This is a, a band structure, yeah, uh, in the case of infinite, yeah on in infinite Bragg reflector, yeah? Bad structure for, peri for periodic medium, yeah? So, and then I took just one period, just one period, and plot the uh, reflectance spectra. You see that here I have the very small reflectance somewhere here. I would like to highlight, it's not a kind of periodic structure. It's periodic structure consisting just of one period. But even, uh, I have only one period, but even here I have the uh, very high uh, reflectance. Yeah, like it's uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 6, like 65%, yeah? Exactly in the, in the region where I would like to have the band gap. First band gap, second band gap, okay. But if I will take like three periods, I will see this kind of table, yeah? Some, I will see the clear trace of the band gap. I have almost perfect reflectance here. But six period, as you see, at, when I have a six period, it's like it behaves like a real semi-infinite structure. Okay, any questions? None. No question. Uh, no, I have. <laughs> ah, you have? Uh, yes, one question. Okay. It can be a little bit stupid, but I didn't get, как сказать там, в общем, когда мы увеличиваем периоды, оно к чему будет стремиться? Какой структуре? Okay, I see. If you will take like a semi-infinite structure, yeah? So infinite in one direction, like infinite number of periods. Actually, you will see only the envelope function. So you see here, you have many additional maxima and minima mm -hmm. between, yeah? But if you will increase the number of periods, you will see only this smooth envelope function. Mm -hmm. Like here, like here, you see? Here, you see no oscillations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, very, yeah. very, very smooth. And here you, you will have uh, the same. Yeah, like very, very smooth. If you increase uh, this number of periods up to infinity. Okay. Mm, thank you. So, uh, 
sorry, but... Uh, yes, please. Do you mean these uh, turnings to zeros uh, will go on? Yeah? Yes. In the case of the uh, same infinite structure, it will be no zeros here. You will have only like this envelope function. But, uh, but in case of finite number of periods, you will have these very fast oscillations. And it's uh, quite easy to, uh, the number of minima equal to number of periods. For example, here you have, or like, uh, let's say, no, one, two, three, four, five. It's like two minus one. So if one period, you multiply by two minus one, it's one maximum. If three periods, it's three by two, it's six minus one, five. One, two, three, four, five. Six multiplied by two, it's uh, 12 minus one, 11, 11. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We get 11. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, in, in principle, uh, if you measure the reflectance spectrum, you could calculate the number of minima between two band gaps you could estimate, uh, you could calculate uh, to count number of periods of periods in your real photonic crystal. How many periods uh, it has? 10, 20, you need to, to just to count number of minima here. And actually, uh, there is interesting paper by uh, uh, Mikhail Rivin, Mikhail Limonov, uh, after the uh, fabrication of this photonic crystal uh, using our like nano 3D printer, uh, they measured the uh, diffraction patterns and, and they uh, calculated the number of this maxima, uh, intermediate maxima, and then uh, uh, calculate the number of the periods in photonic crystal and then uh, compare this number of maxima with a real real image in scanning collector microscope. And of course, they was the same. Okay. And next uh, step is so-called effective medium approximation or quasi-static approximation. So uh, here, you see this is a, a effective medium approximation. So, uh, Next lecture, we will analyze uh, these dispersion equations in some uh, interesting points. For example, in this region, yeah, in this region, uh, we can apply like so-called effective medium approximation when our periodic structure could be described by effective parameters. And we will derive uh, exact expression for effective refractive index. And we will observe that our, for example, uh, periodic structure uh, behaves as uni-axial crystal. So like a, like a uh, homogeneous but anisotropic medium. And we will derive expression for ordinary and extraordinary refractive uh, indices. This is in this region. And then we will also uh, we'll approximate, we will solve our equation, this one, uh, this equation. We will solve it uh, exactly in this region. So we will expand the dispersion equation in the vicinity of the band H near the, uh, uh, the band gap. And we will analytically obtain this behavior. We will see that here we can describe a dispersion by quadratic function. Here, linear function, yeah? But here it's quadratic function. And we will uh, exactly describe the behavior here. And then we can compare, I think somewhere here. Ah, it's not here, but okay, I have, I have a program where I compare. The different solutions. Okay, so effective medium approximation and the, we will estimate also the widths of the band gap. 
today we found only the position yeah of the band gap but what is the width what is depend on yeah it's 100 nanometers 200 nanometers so what is the width of the band gap and how it possible to increase this width of the band gap 